1 Peter 4, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles there. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Good to have everybody with us online. And um, we love you. Thank God for you. Um, while you're turning there, God was right the whole time. All right, let's stand and be dismissed. That was the easiest church service we ever had. There was a story came out uh, on Drudge Report that you've, the Bible talks about a unicorn, right? But not these little white horsey things, okay? The Elasmotherium Sibiricum from Siberia. And it's this, ma- this huge monster. And the base of its horn is about that big around, okay? But it's got a little bitty head like this, no. And it's huge. And God talks about the strength of the unicorn and talks about his power being like the power of a unicorn. And people don't, people scoff and mock at, you know, the Bible because it talks about unicorns and everybody knows, you know. And then they say that, well, there was this creature that lived a long time ago, but man and it did not coexist at the same time. In the article that came out yesterday, they said, uh, yeah, it did. Yeah. Yep. And there's proof now that man and this big, huge Siberian unicorn lived in the same place at the same time. Wouldn't you hate to live in the same house as a unicorn? like having your grandkids over, right, Michaela? No? Not the same thing at all? Well, God's always right, amen? Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's read, uh, I've got verses 3 through 5 up on the screen. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I'll share with you what God laid on my heart for tonight. Uh, For the time pass of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Six things there. It's interesting. Uh, Wherein, verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot Speaking evil of you. Verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick, that would be Clint Eastwood, and the dead. That would be everybody Clint Eastwood killed. Right? Now what does quick here mean? It means alive. That's why we use the word quickly. It means lively. Instead of how I used to do things unlively like so who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead so i want you to look at uh verse three the will of the gentiles and then he gives a list here we're going to focus on that um but the the thing i wanted to look at tonight is the time past the time past all right heavenly father lord we ask for your grace tonight nothing more And, Father, we are established in grace. We're here by grace. We, Lord, are calling upon your name by grace. And, Lord, we thank you, God, for everything that you do for us, everything you have done for us. And, Lord, we cannot even begin, Father, we can't even outline the things that you have done for us, much less take into consideration the things you will do for us. But we know that that number is great. And so, Father, we have very, very many things to be thankful for. Very many things, Lord, to praise you for and to to just pause and worship you as Gideon when he saw the will of God and heard the interpretation of the dream. Before he acted, he worshiped you. And, Father, we have just but to worship you tonight and praise you and thank you, Lord, and We look forward to a day 
when we will spend eternity in doing nothing but worshiping you and being in your golden city, being in your presence. Father, we long for that. Well, Lord, we just ask God that you bless all of us tonight, bless our families, bless all of those that are gathered here online and those with us here. We ask, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would uh, grant healing to those that are sick tonight. Father, we ask, Lord, that you be with Brother Roy and uh, the thing that he goes through, Lord, with the uh, infusion. I pray, God, that you give him grace. Bless Sister Bonnie. Father, be with Roy's sister there in the nursing home. And Father, Lord, um, just ask God that you bless those, Lord, that are uh, in bereavement right now over lost loved ones that have died. And I pray, God, that you would just bless uh, my sister's family. And, Lord, God, just visit with them in this time. Father, Lord, that you would open up your word to us and remind us, dear God, of where we were. Remind us, dear God, and help us to be thankful, Lord, of where we are now. And Lord, we just pray, God, that you would keep us, Lord, in your good grace and in your will always. Help us to serve you, to honor you with everything that we say and do. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. Help us to love you and help us to love one another. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. I was going over this. This is what really stuck out to me was there, that what he said there in verse 3, For in time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. The context of that is he's talking about suffering. In verse 1, for as, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, I don't, I don't want to get into any boasting tonight, but I want you to think about the place that you used to be and the things that you just don't do anymore because God brought you out of that. That was the old man. That was in the old days. The Bible phrase for that is time past. So instead of, you know, we, we would say old time. So instead of calling Sterling the old timer, I would call him the time pastor, maybe. Something like that. For in time past. And, but verse, he, that he should no longer, verse 2, that he should no longer should live the rest of his time in the, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. One of the signs of you knowing that beyond any doubt that you are saved is that nature in you now that instead you used to look for the opportunities of when you could get in sin again, when you could go do this and when you could go do that, but now you have that new nature in you and your desire is truly, tr not just for a show among men, but truly in your own life and in your own mind, your conscience being cleared that you don't want to be a part of that anymore. You don't want to be in that same excess of riot. He used that term. You don't want to be the way you used to be back in the day. You want those things gone. And thank God because... God has wrought suffering, trial, tribulation, persecutions in us, doing that for His glory, His honor, because uh, Hebrews chapter 12, Job chapter 5, where He talks about chastening us as sons, be, and God chastening us to drive those things away from us so that we just don't want to do those things anymore because they hurt. Amen? Our nature is we want them gone. And because of the things we have been through, we look at our life now and we say, you know what? Now that I think about it, it's been a long time since I wanted this. Or it's been a long time since I said these words. It's been a long time since I hang around or hung around the people I used to hang around. Been a long time since they came around me or that I came around them or that I even wanted to be around them. It's just, that's just a long, long time since I've done that. And I think I'm better off now not being there with them or not doing these things or whatever than I ever used to be. And that's what he's getting at here. So the sufferings that God has allowed us to go through has wrought 
And you know me, I'm all about the righteousness of Christ and the holiness, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit on our lives. But the Bible also clearly teaches clean living, holy living, separation from the things of this world. And I get it. Our flesh craves certain things. We want to be part of that. We want those in. But God works His work in us, and He's changing our will, and now we just don't want that. We don't want that in there anymore. So we can truly say, God, I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm very thankful that I'm not what I used to be. There's a song I'd, I'd probably need to work on that and sing. But I, I just, I like that idea. Look at, look at the list that he gives. Uh, he wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness. What, what is, how is lasciviousness defined in the Bible? What is lasciviousness? He's took, it took me years to know, even know how to pronounce that word. Yes, Caleb Michael, let me hear your wisdom on what lasciviousness is. I gave him a half point for that one. Okay. The basketball rolled around the rim for a long time. All right. What is lasciviousness? Huh? Lasciviousness is everything. We use the word dirty. Dirty words. Dirty thoughts. Dirty deeds. Okay? They all have to do with lustful immorality. That's lasciviousness. Okay? Could it be said that our society in this country in 2018... I didn't even finish the... Cindy's back there going. I didn't even finish what I was saying. Could it be said, Cindy, that our society right now is a very lascivious... Okay. Absolutely. Very adulterous, very lascivious, people given over to, I mean, in time past in this country, a first date, there wasn't even a guarantee that there should be a kiss going on, right, in time past. Now, there's almost the expectancy of fornication, first contact. That's the culture and the society that we have created in this country when we decided God shouldn't be in our schools anymore. Amen? Those preachers preaching back years ago on that stuff, they were right. But we walked in lasciviousness. We walked in lust. Not just filthy lust. Something wrong? Okay. Not just filthy lust, but... Lust, lusting after the things of this world, uh, the tenth commandment, uh, the first thing that you're not to covet was what? Huh? Your neighbor's house. Very first thing on the list was your neighbor's house. It, and his wife was kind of down there on the list. But uh, we lust after rich houses or nice houses or things. Um, Black Friday, what does that become? What does the night of Thanksgiving become in this country? What does this whole deal of Christmas become in this country? It's nothing more than a lust for merchandise, a lust for things. You can't eat them. You can't eat them. When the, if, when the fa I'll say when the famine comes to this country, those 60-inch flat panels ain't going to mean a whole lot. Okay, you'll have to have about 20 of them to sell for a piece of bread, maybe. Okay, but that's what we've turned into. That's who, that's who practically everybody's flesh has got lust in it somehow, some way, because we are of the lust of the eyes, of, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So excess of wine, drunkenness. Uh, I, would, I would include in that uh, drug use, both, non-pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical anything to get high anything to catch a buzz anything to alter your consciousness anything 
uh, that corrupts the sober state of mind is an excess of wine. This is how we used to be. There wasn't a drink we wouldn't drink. There wasn't a drug we wouldn't take. Well, and people start out, you can say what you want to about marijuana, but it is the gateway drug. It is the gateway drug. Am I right on that, John? Okay, am I right on that, Cubby? It's the, the gateway drug, okay? And so it's excess of wine, revelings. What is that? Parties. Parties. Now, when I think party, I think best party I ever had was when I was turned five and my mom planned a surprise birthday party for me. I'll never forget as long as I live. I thought it was awesome. You know, having a little hat on going <laughs> with that little thing you blow out, okay? To, that's my idea of party, okay? A get-together is more my idea of party. But if you've ever been, well, some of you used to party. I don't want to hear it. If you've ever been around, that, going to a cruise ship, okay? There's whole sections of a cruise ship you just don't want to go around because that's what they're doing. It's, everything's a big party. And there are some people, they just live to go to the next party. Get drunk, act stupid, do things, get in fights. There's a man lost his life the other night. They finally caught one of the guy. He lived down in Bon Terre, over here in Sauge, Illinois. Was at a bar. And apparently they got into it, and they killed this guy. Cold blood. So this guy's dead. This guy's in prison now, probably for life, if they convict him, if they don't execute him. He'll be there for life because he wanted to go party. Okay? That's how it, that's how it used to be. Banquetings. Okay? Now, now we're getting in my area of expertise. Okay? Huh? Yeah, well, it's this idea of excess. Okay? Having, having big things where food and drink is everywhere, and we just let food go to waste and food go to rot, and we have so much food in this country. Okay? Abominable idolatries, which is number six. To me, that's interesting, because the mark of the beast, that number is six. And it's related to the image that the false prophet sets up, and then he makes everybody receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. But ab abominable idolatries. Uh, there are people who have come from an idolatrous background, whether it's Buddhism or Islam or any of these other religions or even Roman Catholicism or some of these other mainline denominations where they have a statue in there where they're going to pray prayers to or read prayers to or whatever. Those are abominable idolatries. That, and to me, this lifestyle goes hand in hand with that. Because it's the idea and the mindset that you can do all these things, but as long as you perform this little religious ceremony, then all those sins are gone, and you can just go out and do more of it. Okay? And uh, those things are not right. But that used to be part of the life that, uh, pr well, practically every one of us, in one way or the other, lived at one point, and we don't want any part of it anymore. That is the time past. And it should stay there. Amen? Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I mean, I saw that, that phrase there, in time past. It just hit me. Mike, think about that. Think about how we used to live. The things, how we used to think. Uh, we had a young lady, when I was pastoring out at Richwoods, um, she was, um, it seemed like to me she was a school teacher, young, young lady. She had just been married and was a young school teacher. And, um, she started coming to church and it didn't take her long to, she got saved. She gave her heart to the Lord. And I can remember her testifying maybe a month or so after she got saved. She just stood up and testified. She said, you know, before I was saved, she said, of course, you know, I went to university and I'm you know, trained to be a teacher, and they teach you all these things in university, like, you know, it's okay to be gay, and, you know, uh, abortion's okay, and all this stuff like that, and she said, just for some reason, when I got saved, I didn't see those, those things as being right anymore. I didn't 
I didn't tell her that as conditions of her being saved. I want to know, do you hate abortion? I never asked her that. God wrought that in her and the, and the politics that she used to be a part of when she was lost, she, when she sees these, what are now political issues, she sees them now differently than she used to when she was lost. That was the old her. The old way of thinking, the old way of doing, the old way of, the old way of voting, the old way of acting, the old philosophy. So Galatians chapter 1 verse 11, I certify you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. And Paul's going to talk about his own time past. For I neither received it of man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation, there it is, in time past. Now let me say to you, you don't, it's not, it's okay to have a past. Everybody's got one. Now, you may not want to just open up and unzip all the details of everything that you used to back then. Probably it's better off that you don't. If God buried them, keep them buried. And don't let some psychotherapist say, now we got to go dig all that back up now if you're ever going to be whole. No, it's dead. Leave it there. Amen? Let some things be done and over with. But it's okay to have a past. Everybody's got one. You might be living it now, okay? And 10 years, 20 years down the road, you'll say, well, that's how I used to be back in the old days. Okay, but Paul had that past, and he didn't mind using that as his testimony. Where did it, in fact, I think it's good for visitors or lost people to hear the people in this church stand up and say, let me tell you who I used to be. Let me tell you some of the things I used to do. Let me tell you the things I used to be a part of, the, th the way I used to think. Because they hear that, and it, believe it or not, you probably got a lot of lost people out there that have this idea that church people have always been church people, and they've always been perfect all their life, and that's why I'll never be fit in a church anywhere, is because I'm not that way. It probably is good for them to hear that you didn't start out in church. But that's where you ended up. So Paul said, in time past, in the Jews' religion. Okay? Yes? I didn't hear you. Yeah. 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 You know, when you said work, I thought you was talking about a different scenario with this same idea. This is how I used to be. This is the way I used to do things at work, and now I do it. Because I remember when Matthew first started, he got his cert certification at schooling to be a carpenter and he finally got in with a carpenter outfit now he got in with probably the biggest carpenter company in the st louis area they had what four five six hundred carpenters it was a lot it was in the hundreds they had houses everywhere and a guy that him and uh caleb and his boy were playing football together and he told me he said i hope he gets in with a good crew because if he don't he said, they'll just, he said he'll probably never make it. I said, why is that? He said, a lot of these guys that have been doing this 20, 30 years, they forget that their first day on the job, they didn't know anything. They didn't know nothing. And he said, if he gets in with some, maybe somebody that's older, that's a little bit wiser, that can take him in and show him, okay, this is what we do, this is how we do it, okay? And, you know, then after a while, put his foot in his rear end, that's fine. But he said a lot of these guys forget that when they first were cubbing in, they were just like 
the cubs that are there now, and he said they have no patience, no tolerance for them, and that is exactly what happened with him. He got in with a crew of guys that ridiculed him, gave him all the dump grunt work. Nobody was willing to take him under their wing. Nobody was willing to train him because they all forgot that that's how they used to be. Okay? And, I, and that's where I thought you was going with it, but I, it works, doesn't it? Okay? You know, take, take that, then uh, you, can apply that, you can apply biblical principles in every area of life. Okay? But even, even in old religious ideas that you used to hold on to, it's okay to stand up and say, you know what? I used to be an idol worshiper. I used to think that I could do good enough to please God. I used to think that God was like this, or that there was no hell. Or it's, it's okay to have that past. I've been very open and honest about the doctrinal mistakes that I have made in the past, especially concerning the Bible. That's the biggest one right there. I was dead wrong. And so that's what Paul's doing here. He said, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. When I get around these guys, pastors, and I'm preaching at their church, and these guys have been King James all their life, I tell them, I, I used to hate you guys. I used to be your number one enemy. I made it a point to ridicule you every time I opened my mouth. I hated the King James only movement. Okay? And, and I'm like Paul. God made me one of the spokesmen. Okay? And I, I don't mind it at all. So he said, that's what Paul said. I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And I think Paul shook his head every day of his life going, why did I do that? Remembering the day that he was holding Stephen's coats, or the, holding the coats of the men that were killing Stephen. Okay? And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my father. If anybody, if anybody would have made heaven by works of the law, it would have been Paul. And he's saying that. He's boasting on this, but he's telling the truth. If anybody was zealous for the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that was me. But he said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, I immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. The road to Damascus is what changed Paul. Paul didn't, Paul didn't change himself. Paul did and he's not putting on a show either. Paul knew that if it wasn't for Christ meeting him and intervening in his life, he would have killed more Christians, would have had all that blood on his hands for eternity. Eternity in hell will, will never wash away the blood of the saints that Paul would have had killed. So it's okay. Hey, moms and dads, it's okay to admit when you're wrong to your children, okay? Or to let your children know, hey, you know, before you knew me as dad or before you knew me as mom, I wasn't the greatest person in the world, okay? I don't bring up my mom's past, but I remember some of those things. And so does my mom, but that's not who she is anymore. That's not who I am anymore. So we all have that past, even if it's a religious past. That's because there's going to be somebody who used to be that same way religiously. And you can say, let me tell you how God worked with me. Okay? And that applies. I, I won't say it. I won't say it. Move on. Verse 16. <laughs> Next passage, Ephesians 2. Turn there. I was going to say it applies to everything but the flat earth. So Ephesians 2. Verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's who you used to be. Ephesians 2, verse 1, wherein in time past ye walked. See, there it is, in time past. Back in the old days, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. 
the spirit that now work that now worketh in the children disobedience the same spirit that let's say um, give me somebody that's real wicked in the world movie star or rock and roll star or something like that give me some, Hillary. Hillary wow well, we're not pulling any punches here are we okay same sp- watch this Mike since you open your mouth same spirit that she's under now you used to be under same spirit wicked wicked evil okay so verse 3 among whom also we all had our conversation in times past we all were there all of us in times past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind see it's not it's not just what you do Chris it's what you think because while you may be able to hide from everybody else and everybody thinks you're really that guy up here in Imperial that killed that raped and killed that gal at that Catholic store all his neighbors said oh he's a great guy he could fix just about anything whoop de do okay you can hide things from people and keep it in your mind but a mind sin is just as bad as an action sin okay the whole tenth commandment is nothing but mind sins nothing but that so uh, desires the flesh and mind and we're by nature the children of wrath isn't that means you were going to hell verse 4 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us when you're thinking about other people and how lost they are remember yourself being just like them this is what is supposed to prevent God's church from exalting herself above measure so even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved you got to throw that in there Verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice this, the contrast. In times past, we fulfilled the desires of the flesh. But in verse 7, that in the ages to come. You see the contrast? I mean, at this point now, Brother George, we're in this intermediate stage. We're not who we used to be. But we're not yet who we're going to be. Okay? But thank God we're headed in the right direction. And that's, that's how we're supposed to see both ourselves and one another. We are in the place where we're not what we used to be, but we're not where we're supposed to be yet either. Okay, but we're going there. In ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through. See, that's the area that that's in now. The by grace are you saved through faith is in the whole context of in time past. This is who you used to be. Um, for by grace are you saved through faith. Say this out loud with me. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should. And boy, we do, don't we? So verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So this idea here that we're not saved by works, but we are saved to do good works. Or we are saved for that, so that God could cause us to do good works. God is going to make you look good. God is going to make you look better than you've ever looked. He's going to clean you up. He's going to glorify you. He's going to magnify you. He's going to sanctify you. He's going to make you look better, smell better, act better, talk better, be better than you've ever, than you ever deserved, but that you ever have been. It's go- so this idea that, well, we're saved. Now, if you don't do anything, that's okay. No, that's not okay. To me, that's not saved. Because if God's not working through you, something ain't right. God's going to do something through you, small or great, because that, that's what he does. He's going to clean you up. 
He's going to sanctify you. He's going to, he's going to have you as a part of the body no matter what. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past, there it is, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Even by Jews' standards, we're wicked. Why? Because we were uncircumcised Gentiles. Not even, not even fulfilling the law in that part. Verse, uh, the, in the flesh made by hands, verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now... So in time past, this is what we used to be. In ages to come, it's what we will be. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by what? The blood of Christ and nothing else. So aren't you glad the old days are old? And even now, it's quickly fading away. So even, let's say, that, let's say that tomorrow, I mean, you've got good hopes, tomorrow's going to be a good day, but it ends up not being. And you're just racked with guilt, and God's just tearing you up. The next morning, Friday morning, you wake up, having in mind, the mercies of God are renewed every day. The inner man is renewed in knowledge every day. The old man is getting older and older, waxing away, waning away, but the new man is renewed every day. So from this day forward, it is going to be better a little bit every single day. Now, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Somebody, I had... I had this in mind, I forgot to put it in my notes. Somebody look up the word effeminate. E-F-F. -F. In the Bible. Not in the dictionary, in the Bible. E-F-F. -F. There's a place in Scripture I want to go to. I don't know, I'm asking you. Don't look at me, I'm asking you. Huh? E-F-F. Ephem. E-F-F-E-M-I-N-A-T-E. Effeminate. Where's that? Where's that in the Bible? Help me out here. First Corinthians 9. See, I was going to say that. First Corinthians 6. 9. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah, I, this is what I had in mind. Look at verse, look at first Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, or, excuse me, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. What does that mean? What does it imply? Okay. Okay. It, it, it's the idea of a homosexual practice. Okay? Now, and here's why I'm saying this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read on, then I'm going to double back on this. Effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, uh, some say that they, they take the extreme left that God even makes the sodomite and God loves them just the same so it's okay for them to be that way. That's not biblical. Some would take the opposite extreme and say anybody who's ever done that is already canceled out of heaven. They can never be saved. They can never be changed. They can never be cleansed. That's not 
also not saved, or not the Bible. That's not doctrine. That's not true. In my opinion, there are two types of those who have participated in homosexual acts or whatever. There are those who, by nature of the group of people they're in with or whatever, may have been caught into that and not turned over to a reprobate mind. Because here, he plainly says, some of them were effeminate, but God then pulled them out, washed them, sanctified them, and cleansed them. But clearly, and I might even say an overwhelming majority of those who have put themselves in that lifestyle, they are never coming out of it. They don't want to, and God has turned them over. He has seared their conscience with a hot iron, means that they do this and they don't think anything wrong with it. Two people come to mind. One, and they were both gospel music singers. One had to admit that he had been with men, he was being blackmailed by one, and he desperately sought repentance and salvation. And my heart goes out to that one. The other one, I don't mind giving his name, Ray Bolts, had some of the best gospel songs in even contemporary Christian or Southern gospel. He was one of these crossover guys. I went to see him in concert. Great, great music, great testimony, but then, not too long after that, he comes out, admits that he is a sodomite. He's glad that he's a sodomite, God wants him to stay a sodomite, and he's now he's only going to sing in churches that are open to... Ex and I'm going, well, of course you are. Because none of the other churches are going to have you. To me, that guy is reprobate. He doesn't want forgiveness because he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. He thinks it's okay for him to be that way because, after all, he does love somebody. Just another man. So he does not think he's doing anything wrong while this other one desperately wants forgiveness. Desperately wants it. Okay? Now, again, I'm glad I'm not God sitting in heaven being a judge. If I was God, I'd be a lot better at it than I am. Okay? But, I, I know that people who have practiced these things, God has saved some of them and brought them out. One that I was, God allowed me to lead him to salvation before he died of AIDS. And I knew it. I knew it. And when I went to visit him, as he's dying, he couldn't speak, but he could nod his head. And I said, I said, Jimmy, do you, I said, are you still, you still love Jesus? I said, do you know that God saves sinners? You know, everything you were part of was a sin, including being with guys. He knew it. So, his gay buddies came to me. And they said, we just think it's so great that you as a minister are so open-minded. And I went, stop right there. I think I know where you're going. And let me cut you off right here, okay? Let me tell you something about your former friend, okay? He's not going to heaven because God excuses what everybody's doing and God loves everybody. He's going to heaven because he admitted to God, to me, to his sister that everything he did with you guys was a sin. He didn't like me too much after that. But I told him the truth, okay? Now, we had his funeral here, and there was a militant lesbian wanted to decorate the whole church in AIDS ribbons. I said, over my dead body. And I think she knew somebody that could have done that to me, okay? She did not make eye contact with me. She did not look at me. She hated, she, you could just tell. She had devils all in her. 
Okay? Some people, God turns them over. There's no doubt in my mind. Okay? But there's always that one that when God brings them out, I don't mind, because I want to I want, I want open something up here. I know for a fact that people on the other side of that camera, on at least two different occasions, if I'm remembering right, they have confessed to me that they have done that. And they hate it. So I know they're listening. Maybe, there's some, maybe the people that told me that, they don't watch anymore, I haven't heard anything from them in a long time, maybe there's somebody else out there. Because there's a lot of people on the other side of the camera. And I want you to know, if God can still deal with you, you get it right with God while God's still in a dealing mood. Even effeminacy. God can wash you and cleanse you and sanctify you and make you whole again. And there's, hey, there's nothing like it. Doesn't matter what the sin is. Okay? Um, one last thing, very quickly. Very quickly. Second Peter. Turn there very quickly. The quicker you turn there, the quicker I'll get you out of here. I know you're just itching. I don't really think that. Second Peter, chapter 2. You see, in time past, we used to be this way. For the most part, we're not that way anymore. There's still some things that God's helping us with. But our future is that we have great promises that we're striving for. The opposite of that is, verse 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter and is worse with them than the beginning. You see, the way it is with God's people is, is that their, be, their latter end is better than their beginning. Where they used to be was awful. Where God's taking them is far better than where they used to be. Amen? But then there's some who come and they make a show. Okay? The knowledge of it. But then they get entangled back, and God said the latter end is worse than the beginning. And I just kind of think that it's, it's healthy. I think for a good, honest Christian to kind of in some ways think that maybe if I get caught back up, Roy, come here for a second. Got him on the way, but Roy, would it be okay for you to take another drink tonight? No. Why not? It'd be worse now. He knows that. It's okay for him to know that to go to take another drink would probably end up being worse than he, than he is now, even. Or that he ever was. I think it's okay to have a little bit of that in your mind. I mean, I like knowing that I'm saved. Okay? But I don't think there's nothing wrong with God putting the fear of God in you. Okay? Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, let's bow our heads. I want you to tell God thank you for where you came from. And I want you to tell him thank you that you're not there anymore. In time past, in time past, you're not there anymore. But you're also not where you want to be either. So all the work that God has put into you so far He's not done, so don't you be done either. You're still not good enough for the kingdom of God. Okay? So let God make you better today or tomorrow than you were today and yesterday. In time past, don't ever forget the hole that God dug you out of. 
Father, I love you. And I thank you, God, for your people, Lord, and their honesty. And Lord, I know these people, and I know some of the things, some of the roads they've been down, some things, Lord, that they've never told me, but I, sometimes I see it on their face. I see it in, their, in what they don't say. And I know, God, that each and every person in this room, each and every person in this room, is glad that we're not back where we used to be. And we shake our heads in shame. Shamed of ourself that we ever got caught up in those things. But God, you are so rich in mercy. And you pulled us out of that pit, that hole that we dug. You set our feet on a solid rock and established our going. So Father, we are thankful, God, that you've done that for us. And Father, we just ask, Lord, that the same way that you have changed us from then till now, that you keep doing that to change us from here to what we will be. And help us, God, to every now and then just have a little bit of it in our minds that even going back a step is probably not going to turn out good for us. So don't do it. God, there's some places that we can never go ever again. Some people we cannot ever see ever again or be around ever again. Just some things, God, that cannot ever be a part of our life. God, we're okay with that because we know that you're the one that took them out. Father, keep doing the work in us that we need done. We'll give you all the praise, Father, for in time past that those days are gone. We thank you for this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.